recording and we're in business. Okay, so when Eclipse opens up for the very first time when you've never used it on a workspace before, it always brings up this fancy welcome screen. The welcome screen is for people who've never seen the product before and it has lots of big buttons to help you navigate and see the stuff that's in there. We really don't care. So when you see this thing, the best thing that you can do is just close up the welcome screen and get to the, the normal state of affairs. Okay. Um, Eclipse tries to do a bunch of things for you. This left-hand space that you see that's called Package Explorer is the place where it's going to put the view of all of the files and all of the projects that you have for all of the folders below that workspace folder. Okay, So it's basically a file manager for that restricted set of files. Uh, this space in the middle is going to be where you typically do your text editing. Um, so all of the, the Java programs are going to pop up in there and the output of error messages is and the output of the program is going to appear down below in this little area down here. Okay. Uh, it also tends to Eclipse because it manages these sort of large projects. When you first start using it, it looks very barren. You know, there's not much in it, and there's, it seems like you have to go through a lot of dialog boxes to do some fairly simple things. It's just because it's intended for a larger environment. So the general answer for a lot of the stuff that we're going to do is when you see a whole bunch of dialog boxes popping mm -hmm. up, it's just take the defaults and hit OK. And generally the defaults, no matter what they say, are going to be right for the type of projects that we're doing. Okay, So don't be worried about all of the details. I'll show you the basic details you need to fill in. So let's start. Um, now that we've got this high level folder for storing all of the Eclipse stuff, the next thing down is you can think of if I were doing a company, uh, projects for a company, I might have more than one project that I'm doing for company A. And so this level down <coughs> is subfolders within the, the folder that you've already created at the highest level. So I might have a subfolder for Camosun for the registration system that I'm working on. I might have a different <coughs> one for a project I'm doing for the computer science department, all split up into, into uh, the sub projects. And again, it, it looks rather empty. In Eclipse, any time that you come up with a new idea, so, gee, I want to do Pfeiffer's Lab 1, you make what's called a brand new project. Okay? So under the File menu, there's File, New, Java, Project, and that's the thing that you're going to make all the time. Uh, new project basically just creates a folder, so I'm going to make a folder called Lab 1 for the stuff I'm going to do for Lab 1. Ignore all of the rest of the gunk in it and say Finish and it creates a folder. And again, if you go and look in the actual file manager, you'll see it's made a folder. And if you crack open the little triangle, you'll see that it's dumped a bunch of gunk into that folder. So it pre-makes some stuff that you're going to need. This is all the Java libraries that it's going to need to run the Java code. It's all just dumped in there for you and you're ready to start working on your code. The place where all your code goes is in that little SRC beast there that's got nothing in it right now. So it's going to try to organize your project into the different pieces that are different components that are necessary. So now we've made a high level folder, we've made lab one, now we actually have to make our first Java file. So we're three levels deep before we make a Java thing. Uh, so under file again there's new and you can make a new class that way using the file browser or using the file menu or you can select this thing here, the little C, that says make a new Java class. Okay, And for, right, for now, right now, Java class means Java program. The only thing that you really have to type in here is the name of the program. So I'm going to call this starter for want of a better name. You don't have to put the .java extension on. That's going to be done for you. And in this case, because it's the program where things are going to start out, you have to put in a main. And I think Python has that same sense of here's the place where the program starts. And I think it's even called main, isn't it? Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. So same idea as Python. It's just got a bunch of gobbledygook. Okay. Hit finish. And what it will do is it will create the starter code for you. And it will the file manager will now show that there's that starter.java file that I've created. 
the subtle rule in Java is that the name of the file and the name of that first line that has the class definition there have to match exactly. <coughs> so this is called capital S starter and the class name had better be called capital S starter otherwise it won't work. And it just automatically does that for you from the fact that I created starter.java. Okay. The code template that it produces has got a couple of sort of useless comments in there that are used for other things that we don't care about. So I'm just going to get rid of the comments to get it down to the basic stuff. <clears throat> and you can see that there's a main in this class and then there's a surrounding sort of wrapper called starter that has the whole works. Okay? So just like with Python, when you start writing your code, you're going to start writing it in that little, little routine called main. Just a quick question for something else. Uh, which community is it? Uh, comp 132. Yeah. Okay. So let's just do the, the, the sort of hello world type of thing. So here's do a print statement that just says hello in it. Now print statements in Java are a bit of a pain. <laughs> Okay, notice it doesn't just say print, it has to say system.out.println with a capital S. Okay, that's just the way it is. We're going to find out we don't typically need these a lot, so it's not going to be a huge problem. How do you feel about formatting? We'll worry about that later. Just sort of follow the style is the easiest answer for now. Okay, so there's our Java program. Let's turn around and run it. To run it, you hit the green button, run button, and say run. Uh, it brings up these dialogues. This one, for instance, says, do you want to save before you <coughs> run it? The answer for a lot of these annoying ones is typically yes, just always save it for me before you run it. So I'm going to click the Always button and then say OK. And it runs the program, and there's the output that appears down there. OK? Save all the other stuff for later. We'll just concentrate on getting through this. Okay, so there's a program that prints hello. Now let's change it up a bit to do something else. Suppose we want a variable. Make a variable x and we'll give it a value. We'll make a variable y and we'll give it some other value. And then we'll do the result. Something like that. And then we'll change this print statement to say result is and the way that you get a variable in there is you add a plus sign for string concatenation and you give the name of the variable like so. Okay. Run this one and there's result is 30. Okay. The other thing that's not obvious about Eclipse is it starts to remember the thing that you did last and will just automatically repeat it for you. So for instance, the run command remembers that you were running this program last. If you start a new project and then try to do something else, you'll discover if you hit the run command, it's probably going to run the old thing. Okay. So if you want to be certain that it runs the new thing, if it's running the wrong one, you can go down, basically click inside the file, select run as, and say, no, I want to run this thing as the Java application I'm running now. And from then on it'll remember that's the current one you're working on. So it definitely has a sense of this is the current stuff that you're doing and you usually have to coerce it to change its mind. Okay, questions about that so far? Seems easy. Don't worry about the gobbledygook. Uh, for one thing, um, we're probably not going to use much of what that actual argument is. We don't really care. Uh, the second thing is that when it comes to exam time, all that I care about is that you can copy those words off of the paper that you've got onto the exam paper and go, oh, that's what you need to start a Java program. It needs a main. Okay? So don't worry about the syntax. That's just the place where it starts. We'll worry about all of the, those details later when it becomes important to talk about what they're actually for. Okay, well, that seems sort of interesting. Um, let's, let's do something else here. Uh, 
a lot of times the reason that people put print statements in their code is as sort of a debugging tool so they can just sort of check the thing as they're going and see what the output is going to be. So there's two different styles of print statements. There's the styles of print statement that say this is actual output from the program that's useful and then there's the debugging style print statements. And this thing is basically what I'm going to call a debugging style. My intention was just to see whether or not this worked before I added any more code. Um, so let's let's talk about debugging for a second. Did you get to use a debugger in Python? No, you're looking at me like you don't know what one is, right? Well, okay. It sort of has uh, I'll, debug, like. I'll, I'll, I'll start out by saying there's two different philosophies in the computer science world. There's one philosophy that says the way that you understand programming is by you being the computer and by you sitting there with a piece of paper and every time the computer does something you go, okay, I'll make a little box with X in it, I'll make a little box with Y and I'll try to figure out what the computer is doing. So I'm going to be the computer. Okay? And the sense is that if you know what the computer is doing and you can follow the code and you can trace it out yourself, you'll have a good idea of how the thing works. Okay? The other style or the other philosophy is to say, that's just a waste of my time. The computer already knows the computer. I wonder if I can get the computer in assisting me and showing me what it's doing. Okay? And use the computer as a tool for helping it debug itself. Okay? And there are two competing philosophies because the one philosophy is going to argue, well, you need to know how it works in order to, to write the code. And the other one's going to argue, that's just a waste of my time. Okay? I come from the, it's just a waste of my time philosophy, so I'm going to show you the tool that's going to make your life easier. Okay? So here's how it's done. What you do is you go double click in this gray area here, and that sets this thing that's known as a breakpoint. And a breakpoint just means when you get to here, stop the program from running any further so I can go take a look and see what it's doing. Okay? So put the breakpoint in there to say stop when you get to what's essentially the first line of the program. And then instead of hitting the run button, I'm going to move over here and I'm going to click on our friend the bug. Okay? And when you click on the bug, the first thing it does is it brings up this weird dialog that says, which the basic implication is, I'm going to rearrange your whole screen for you. Do you mind if I do it? And again, the answer to this is invariably yes. Just go ahead and rearrange the screen however you want to. And it reformats the screen a little bit differently. We've still got the source code sitting here in the center, uh, but there's this weird thing that's popped up here that we'll talk about later. And then off to the, to the right side, there's this thing that, that says variables. So let's watch what happens. When you're using the debugger, this little strip pops up here that's got all the useful commands. And so what I'm going to do is there's one here that's called step over. I'm going to click on step over, and it puts the variables up in the variable window as they get created. So there's x, just like you would do if you were writing it on a piece of paper as you're stepping along. Step over one more time, there's y. Step over one more time, there's the value of result conveniently displayed for you. Okay? So notice that now there's no reason to change the code to add a print statement to see whether or not I got the calculation right. It's already there for you to see. Already it sounds uh, easier than okay. Python. So the computer is doing the work of showing you what it's doing step by step. So the debugger basically allows you to run your program in slow motion and see step, 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 let's watch it do every line of code. Okay. So when you're done with this, the trick at this point when you're debugging is to say, I don't need to see anything more. I don't need to bother with this line. I'm done looking at this version of the program. Since I'm going to go add more code, make sure you hit the kill button here to terminate this instance of the program. If you don't hit the kill button and you go start up another debug session, you'll end up with another version of the same program running. And every time you hit the run, you end up with a different version. And once you have 20 or 30 of the same version running, it gets really confusing to figure out which one you're working on. So the habit is to always kill off the one you're running before you go back and do another one. It should have been the default, but it's not. Okay? So make sure you kill things off. Okay. Well, we've got some more code here. Um, suppose that I want to continue on and write some more code. I'll do something like, uh, uh, let's see, we'll add some more to result. 
we'll add another uh, five to it. So there's the shortcut. That's the same as result equals result plus five. Okay, um, and then I'll bring in some other variable, and I'll subtract that from result. Z. Oops. Notice it uh, did this yellow highlight. The yellow highlight there says, hmm, that's probably not a good thing to do. So yellow highlights are a hint. You've done something that's maybe not the best thing to have done, and so you can correct that. Okay? So that's what yellow means. While we're on the subject, uh, notice that as you're typing, it's trying to, uh, uh, figure to, trying to parse your code. And so there it's already discovered as I'm typing that I'm uh, missing a semicolon. And it's giving me a good hint there and saying, oh, okay, you've got an error. I think you need a semicolon. So it catches syntax errors as you go rather than having to wait and go back and hit the, hit the compile button in order to find it. Okay? You need to subtract that there. Um, oh, yeah, one said, what the heck. Okay? Um, so. Now, here's the trick with using the debugger. The usual approach is, oh, okay, uh, the reason I put this breakpoint here was because I want, wrote some new code and I wanted to see if the new code was working correctly. We know the code works at least up until this point. It probably did what we expected to do because we checked the value <laughs> of result. So the trick here is to take the breakpoint off from here because that's no longer interesting and put the breakpoint down on something like this line. Okay. And now what happens is the program, when we run it with the debugger, will speed through the first few lines of code and then stop when it hits the breakpoint for the new code. And so now we can just look at happens with the, what happens with the new code. So we can hit the debug again. It zips all the way through. It gets to the last line and it says, oh, we're about to do this last line of, of the code. So it's buzzed all the way through. Okay. And so now you can see the value of result is 35, and if we do a step over, it subtracts one from result. And notice that in the variable window, as you're stepping over things, if there's a change, it shows you the change highlighted so you can see what variable changed. Sometimes you have to scroll up and down in this window to see all of the values, so there's Z. Okay. And then you can decide, oh, I didn't mean to subtract one, I meant to subtract Z. Now is where you would kill it off again. Go back to the Java window, which has the regular edit view. It's easier to make the change there where you can see more source, source code. So, oh, I meant Z there. We'll change it to Z, run it again with the debugger in the same place that we were before, do a step over and see whether now it produces the correct result. I'm just wondering, so you could change your code right now. You can change your code in the debug window if you want, but you're best to have stopped the thing before you make the changes. Otherwise, it's going to get confused. Why are you changing this code out from under me when I'm trying to show it to you? And then I'll be saved back. And it's still saved in this. It's still, it's just a different view of the same thing. I just tend to always go back to this view because I can see more code. And it's just easier to, to space it out and see it. Okay. Well, let's, let's do something else here. Um, it turns out that maybe this sort of stuff I wanted to be in uh, a subroutine instead. Uh, in Java, subroutines are called uh, methods instead of subroutines or functions. Okay? So let's suppose that I want to take this, I want to do this calculation somehow inside a method and return a result. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this thing into a function and I'm going to say result equals uh, some function, call the function, and the stuff that I would pass in, I guess, is uh, let's take x and y and give them as values to some function. This thing becomes some function, and it takes x and y as integers, it does that calculation, and it sends it back. So I'll just get the code in place, and I'll talk about it. Got to make a couple of quick changes here. Uh, I guess, actually, we need to uh, 
uh, yeah, we'll just do it with X and Y. We won't bother with that. I'm really sort of messing it up, but that's okay. Uh, we'll pass in a result. Sure, what the heck. Let's do a save. What am I missing? Uh, I'm missing the brace up there. Uh, it's starting to get a little ugly here for a second. I don't need to say int there anymore, but that's okay. So I made a mess. But it's basically got more or less the same stuff. It really doesn't matter what's in there. Okay. Um, you also have one mini character brace. No, where's my extra brace down here at the bottom? Yeah, it actually will tell you that. Please delete this for me. So we'll delete that one. And we have some code that sort of uh, more or less works. Oh, I need x, y, and result. <coughs> there we go. Uh, that's almost right. Oh, this thing, for whatever reason that I won't talk about now, has to say static on it, and then everybody's happy. Now, notice I just sort of hacked away at it, and, and it looks sort of ugly now for the moment. Here's another beautiful feature of Eclipse. If you go under Source, there's a menu item that says Format, and when you format, it makes it pretty in the approved style. Okay? So you no longer have to worry about where do braces go, what line do they go on, do I indent, all of that stuff is taken care of for you. You just hit Save, and there's the, there's the version all set to go. So source format will be your friend to make things pretty. It also helps show you where to get the indenting right, because you can quite often, once you format it, see where you've missed something. OK, the new piece of code is whatever happens here. Okay, So that's the new stuff that I added. That's the thing that I'm most concerned about. We'll play the same game of running with the debugger. Uh, sorry, I ran a couple of versions there. I'll just kill them both off and get back to one version. Run with the bug. There we go. It's run f quickly through the stuff that we already did, and I'm most interested in what happens with the new stuff. Now, there's two different commands here that are available when you've got to this line that has a function on it. If we hit step over, we'll treat this function as if it were just a single line, let the function do its thing and give a value back and we'll never see what the function actually did. Okay? So step over means just do the thing, I don't care what it does inside. If you want to see how it actually works inside, your other option is this thing called step into. And step into says, I'm interested in seeing how that thing does its job, so let's go in, follow the code in, into that function or into that method. So I'm going to hit step into. And I actually stepped into twice, but that's OK. And notice that I'm now inside some function doing that job. Okay. Notice also up top here, here's where this window is useful because the interpretation of this is saying main at line 11 called this sum function, which is currently at line 17 in this file. Okay? Or conversely, when sum function runs off the end and returns, it's going to go back to main at line 11. And so that's going to get really useful when we've got function A calls function B calls function C calls function D. You'll be able to see the call history of how you got to where you were. Okay? And you can also see the variables at different points. So if I click back on main without running anything, there's the values that main was using at the point where it called some function. And here's the values of the variables that are only shown for the stuff that's in this sum function. So it's only showing you the stuff that's appropriate for the function at the time. Okay. So now this thing is going to do its calculation. Now you can use step over. You can produce some sort of result. You'll see that the result that's coming back is now going to be 9. And 9 is going to go back into the different result variable that's in the main program. So that thing's going to get copied over top of whatever the main has. Main currently has a result as 30, so that variable is going to be overwritten by the result of that function. Okay, So go back to there's some function where we are. So this thing is saying when we run off the end of that function and do a step over, now we're back to main. Okay, I'm done with it, so I'm going to kill it off. And now I can go proceed to do some more debugging. 
Okay, so there's the debugger and a sample program to do whatever you want to do. <clears throat> Questions about that? If you try to step into like the system that up to print line, will it like open that file? And the question is, is what happens if you try to step into system out print line? Uh, the answer is it becomes a mess. <laughs> okay? Uh, and so I'll show you one little trick. Like the problem with step into is if you try to step into this, you don't own the code for print line. And if you do manage to step in it, into it, you're probably going to see a bunch of garbage that doesn't look like it belongs to you and you're going to get caught up in this bunch of busyness. Well, the trick here is that I rarely use step into. Because here, the only reason I put step into there is that I really wanted to get down to here, right? So the trick here is that instead of putting a breakpoint before you call the function and then doing a step into, you might as well instead just put a breakpoint on the first line of the function where you actually wanted to stop. So I can put the breakpoint inside the function instead, and then when I run with the debugger, I'm just in the place where I want it to be to look anyway. Okay, so step into turns out to be almost always a bad idea. You're better off to put a breakpoint on the thing that you actually want to look at. Now, the other thing is, is that it's possible to have more than one breakpoint. So for instance, if I'm, you know, if I sort of know how this thing works, I can do a breakpoint on the fly to say, oh, I just want to keep going until I get back to here. And then what you can do is you can hit the resume button and the resume button will now speed up and run the code until it finds another breakpoint. Okay, so resume, off we go, and we're now hopefully back in main, but it actually exited because it didn't see that breakpoint. Don't know why, but resume will work. Just didn't do it in that case. Um, one other point about uh, debugging, I tend to just use one breakpoint. I mean, you can make hordes of them if you want, but usually one is sufficient because most of the time what you're going to do is you're going to put the breakpoint on new code, you're going to run until you get there, you're going to do a few step overs to make sure it looks like it's doing the right thing, and then you're probably going to kill it off, go back and add some more code, some more new code, put your breakpoint there to see where it's going. The other way that breakpoints get used is when you've got a bug. Right? The code's already there, so you put a breakpoint where you think something is suspicious and then go check and see whether or not the code looks like it's working at that point. Okay? But the rule from now on is that you never, ever, ever need to do a debug statement, a debugging print statement to try to see what's going on in your program. You're always going to use a debugger. Okay? And the second rule is you're never ever going to sit and stare at your code for 15 minutes trying to figure out what the heck it's doing anymore. What you're going to do instead when you're staring at a piece of code, you're going to stare at it for 10 seconds and then you're going to put a breakpoint in there and you're going to say, I'm going to let me show me, let it show me what it's doing. And that's far easier, okay? You can debug stuff in 30 seconds rather than taking 30 minutes to go and look at it. Okay? And so it's a new skill that I'm going to emphasize over and over again. First thing when, when you say, well, I don't know what it's doing, is I'm going to say, put a breakpoint there and let's go look. Let's watch the variables. Let's see how they're changing. Let's see what it's doing. Okay? And so this is more how, how modern developers work with things is by using the debugger to get them to show you what's happening. Okay? One other point about breakpoints. Breakpoint is roughly the human concept of uh, give me a call sometime today if you go for coffee. Okay, that's a break point. You expect somebody to stop what they're doing just before they're, co they're going for coffee, take a break in their day to call you to let you know that it's now time to, to do some sort of interaction. Okay, guess what? If that person has already gone for coffee and they're not going again today, that break point is going to have no effect. Okay, so breakpoints only refer to things that are going to happen sometime in the future for your program, not the things that have gone by already. So if I'm executing through the code and I've gone by this print statement, I can't go back and put a breakpoint and expect that it's, I'm going to somehow magically see it again. The only way you're going to see it again is if you start the program fresh from the beginning and run through the thing again. Okay. So another good use of the debugger is if you have code that you don't understand, you can always, that somebody else has written, you put a breakpoint in the code and you go until it gets hit, 
you know, run the program until the program stops in the debugger, and then you go look and you can step through and see what it's doing. So it's also a way of finding out what other people's code is doing and what the important parts are in other people's code. Okay, any more questions? We're going to use this skill over and over again, so I'm going to, every chance I get, try to bring up the debugger and show you things that you can do with it as our process of development. And believe it or not, I'm okay with making a whole bunch of mistakes in my code because mistakes mean I get a chance to show you what you can do with the debugger. Okay, so there's project number one. What would I do if I wanted to uh, make some other project for lab two? Go under File, New, make a brand new Java project. You can name it anything you want. You don't have to call it Lab 1. You can call it Pfeiffer stuff. You can call it Lab 2, whatever it happens to be, and click Finish, and that gives you a new empty project. I usually close up the old stuff, open up the new stuff, click on Source to say I want to make some source code, click on New Java Class, make whatever name you want for the thing. It should begin with a capital letter. That's the Java convention for, for Java files. So this is more stuff. The other Java convention is that every word within is capitalized. So there's another class. For now, we always want a main in the thing and get it to write the code for you, and now you're all set to try again. When would you not want a main in it? Pardon me? When would you not? Uh, we'll we'll see some code pretty quickly on Monday where we're going to make we're now going to get to make more than one Java file. So there will be one that has the main in it, and then every time we write some other stuff, it'll go into separate files. And so it's not unusual for uh, <coughs> Java programs to have 10, 20, 30, 100 separate files, each with their own self-contained little amount of stuff in them. Okay. Um, any surprises from Python? Kind of Dreamweaver a little bit, I guess. Same. Same sort of thing. Um, let's try one more thing. <coughs> let's try a loop. Oh, just do something like that. I'll just print, put a blank line in here for no reason at all. Okay, so this is now new code that I'm added. I'm going to remove that old breakpoint. I'm going to put a breakpoint, double click to get rid of it, hopefully. Sometimes they don't want to go. That one is being persistent. That's okay, I'll get rid of it later. Um, there's my breakpoint on the loop to see what the loop does. Uh, click the bug to run it, and it stops. Notice that's the old breakpoint. You can try it there, it shut off there. So I shut off the old breakpoint because it was annoying me, and then hit the resume button to go until I find another breakpoint. There's the breakpoint for my loop. Okay. Run a step over. And notice it makes the i variable first, gives i a value of 0. Do a step over. It's now going inside the loop, so it's going to do that calculation once. So there's the step over. And then it goes back up to the top. Result has changed. Okay, And notice that it's incremented i now to be 1. Okay, So another step over. Oops, I'm doing two at once. If I do them slowly, you can see it keeps incrementing. Okay, So you can watch the loop doing it. That loop is going to go 10 times exactly, adding 5 to result each time. Here's another little trick. At some point, it gets a little boring if this thing is a loop for 100 times to be you know, step, 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 step. Usually by the time the loop is done, the first one or two iterations, you've seen enough to know whether or not it's working. The little trick here is to go to the line immediately after the loop, put a breakpoint, remove the one from the loop so that it's no longer active, 
and then hit resume again, which now speeds through however many iterations were left and leaves you seeing the result. And then you can continue on stepping from there or doing whatever you want from there. Okay? So still only using one breakpoint to look at stuff, just changing the stuff I'm interested in. So you can always go take off the current breakpoint, put another breakpoint on for something in the future, and then hit resume and go again until you hit that breakpoint. I no longer exist. Uh, I disappears because that declaration for I is only with the, within the body of the loop. So it's gone after the loop. We'll worry about, loop, about all the different loop styles later. That just happens to be the, sort of the standard C, Java, C++ one for a, for a counted loop. Okay. Uh, kill the thing off because we don't want to see it anymore. Um, Another thing that you might want to do is take this source code uh, and uh, run it at home. So if you've got it in the lab, you might want to take it home. There's a bunch of different ways that you can do that. Uh, I'll show you one of the ones that's guaranteed to work. Uh, one of the things that's guaranteed to work, uh, probably easiest if I'm lucky, is I can take that thing and maybe drag it out onto the desktop on uh, some different computers. There we go. Okay, so that's the equivalent of export it out. It just makes a copy of the thing onto, in this case, my desktop, and then I could take that Java file home with me. When you're using it at home, what you're going to have to do is remake a new project. So what I'd do is I'd go, I'd say file, make a brand new Java project, uh, give the project any name I want. I'll make it something silly. Uh, make an empty project, and then at that point you can turn around and play the same game of, again of dragging and dropping that thing, uh, hopefully back into the SRC folder if I'm lucky on most machines, maybe not this one, uh, and it'll drag and drop back into it. Yeah. Probably works on Windows, don't know if it works on Linux in this case. Uh, your other alternative, if you can't get drag and drop to work, is to, uh, is to do file import and you can say import general file system says go pick something out of the file system go next this dialogue's a little tricky this is actually saying where is the folder that contains the file so you select the folder first which for me is uh, uh, on my desktop so there's the folder uh, say OK <coughs> And then if I'm lucky, it shows the file, which it doesn't. It's hidden somewhere. Anyway, uh, select the file, and it's already, you know, select the place where you want to dump it into, and it'll just dump it in. So there's a couple of ways of importing things, okay? I'm going to probably get you to try them, because quite often what I'll do is I'll leave a piece of source code up on the web page someplace as starter code for a lab, so you'll need to import it. Okay. Another trick that you can play is if you see a piece of code called starter on my website, you know, starter.java, what you can do is you can make a new empty class called starter.java and then just cut and paste over top of the empty one with my starter.java. Okay, has the same effect. But you've got to get the name right. It's got to have the exact same name as uh, the, the initial one that you create has got to have the exact same name as the, as the one as the name that I've given you. Okay. That was importing and exporting. That was using the debugger. That was making brand new Java files to give it a try. Got it. I'll post this code on the, this completed code on the web page so that you can play it and try it and use it if you want. And on Monday what we'll do is we'll start the real Java stuff of, of moving away from <coughs> the Python S stuff into more of the object oriented programming. So tomorrow's when the real Java or Monday's when the real Java starts. See you later.